and welcome to the At Peace Parents podcast. I'm Casey, and I'm here to empower you in your decision making as a parent of a demand avoidant child. My goal is to share insights that will generate aha moments and support your connection with your child. I'm a mom of two amazing little boys, one of whom is PDA, and I've worked with hundreds of parents just like you to teach them how to lead their child out of burnout and find the clarity, peace, and sense of community they need. Welcome to a special live for all of you on Instagram or listening to the podcast specifically on how to manage the holidays and what to expect with a PDA child or teen. So today I'm going to talk about five different things and hopefully support you in getting clarity. And if not clarity, then at the very least camaraderie (laughs) because I've been through it myself. So Today I want to do something a little bit different and bring in to this conversation what I call the 5A framework, which is in the process of being trademarked and it's what I teach in the Paradigm Shift program. And we're going to use that structure to go through different elements of the holidays to help you guys feel more confident going into the next part of the gauntlet. Okay, so the first aspect of the 5A framework is awareness. So what this means is just deeply understanding why your child is having a hard time engaging in paradoxical behaviors or things you don't necessarily understand. So the first thing we wanna be aware of is that excitement can be perceived in the brain and then the nervous system of a PDA child or teen like an internal loss of autonomy or an internal demand. Okay, so what that means is that even though there's all this novelty, excitement, fun stuff that's coming up for Thanksgiving, if you're here in the US, it's next Thursday, Christmas, Hanukkah, New Year's, whatever it is you're celebrating, there's excitement in the air right? And so this is going to be registering as a potential threat because it's a loss of autonomy and an internal demand. So that's one thing we just want to be aware of as we're moving into deeper into the holiday season. And then the second is even if you're not actively participating or reinforcing some of the demands and expectations that occur during the holiday season enters into the neuroception, (laughs) the survival brain neuroception of what's safe and what's not by osmosis, right? Or by energy. So even if you're not making a huge deal of like Santa's coming and we're hanging up the stockings and we're going to get the turkey and all this stuff just by other people's behaviors and actions in the environment, there is a societal demand that increases the threat activation right? So those are the two things that we want to be aware of that are going to be going on during this time of year for your kids. And I want to give you an example. So the demand by osmosis, St. Patrick's Day here in the United States. It's a day where everyone wears green, drinks a lot of green beer, pretends to be Irish. We do not celebrate it. We do not put up decorations. We don't talk about it. And I remember my son just being so activated and manic and equalizing against his brother on St. Patrick's Day when he was still in public school because they were they had little decorations in the room and we're talking about you know leprechauns and stuff and so when he came home there was almost like this intensity of like we have to celebrate this like we need to go make leprechaun traps and we need to go out and buy lucky charms and make art around it so it's not even the direct demands it's also the societal demands that are going to be present and activating for your PDA child or teen, okay? Sometimes excitement is too much for our kids. And so we have to think creatively about ways to accommodate. And we can talk about that in the accommodation section. But before we talk about accommodations, I really wanna talk about something that's almost more important than that, which is the acceptance piece. Okay, so radical acceptance of what you can control as a parent and what you cannot control. Radical acceptance of right now what your family's constraints are instead of avoiding that truth (laughs) and then allowing yourself to accept the constraints so that you can ultimately over time transcend them. So what do I mean by this? Let's ground it in real life examples. So the first thing that we wanna radically accept 
during this time period of the holidays is simply that it's going to be harder for you to make clear-eyed decisions that align with what your family actually needs because there is more pressure on the outside and on the inside. All of your expectations of what Christmas should look like, what the tradition should be, how you experienced it with your family, but also the pressure and judgment that you receive from others in your life, whether it's, you know, things, little things like my neighbors all used to like make cookies and share them on our front porches. And like at that time, my son was in burnout and I could not bake cookies to reciprocate, right? So like normally I wouldn't have been focused on making cookies, but I felt this additional pressure. And this is a small example of like, I'm not able to reciprocate what my neighbors are doing because I'm in this intensive caregiving which where if I divert my attention to like mix flour and try and make something that he's not interested in, it's going to result in a violent meltdown, right? But like, you can't explain that to your neighbors, right? And maybe there's an analogous situation for you of like, oh, everybody in the whole town goes to this Christmas tree lighting or everybody on the block goes to this Christmas party. And so you're going to be feeling those decisions that you're making with more weight. And additionally, like this happens with family as well. Okay, so let me give you an example of a bigger cost benefit decision and how radical acceptance plays a role. So for the past three years, and including this year for Christmas, we have split the kids. Not just like, okay, I'll take William for the day and you take Cooper, but rather like, I'm going to be traveling to my mom's house an hour away here in Michigan with William and my husband is going to be traveling four hours north in Michigan to go skiing right? Like we're going to be completely separate for the Christmas Eve, Christmas, present opening, Santa arrival, all this stuff. Additionally, I've planned it so that I'm flying to Alabama to visit my dad and stepmom with my younger son around the exact same time my older son comes back right? So that they're almost completely split during this time period. The reason I mention this is not to say like, oh, the solution that we can all apply is that we all need to split the kids like Casey's doing, but rather I'm illustrating to you a decision that I made, okay? Because for the past couple years, the thing that I had to accept was that I could not keep everybody safe and well in the home when everybody was home for the holidays and having this extra layer of activation. There was so much excitement, so much waiting, so many demands that my PDA son could not stay safe around his younger brother. The other cost of keeping the family together was that my nervous system was absolutely shot because I was always in hypervigilance, right? Even though he was in out of burnout in the past three years, he was activating to a higher level because of this time period of the holidays, what my family calls the gauntlet, okay? So like the true cost, the true cost of keeping the whole family together for the holidays was that nobody would have fun, everybody would be activated, my son's nervous system would be so activated that it would tip him past his threshold and that I would be hyper vigilant and really not have a pleasant holiday. The true benefit of us all staying together was really more around like financial decisions, right? Like it would be cheaper for us all to stay together and the benefit might be that like we could all see my mom at the same time, which is a benefit for her. But really like I had to distinguish and radically accept like these are the constraints I have. If I keep the kids together, this is what's gonna happen. I can choose this or I can make a different decision, right? Personally, I have different constraints than some families. So I'm just showing you how to identify like, okay, these are my constraints. How can I accept them and make a different decision, right? And so when I did the cost benefit for the alternatives, it was like, yes, the true cost of splitting the family would be psychologically for me and my husband because we don't get to spend time together, financial because we're traveling to do two different places, and potentially there would be a little bit of a psychological cost to the kids if they're not together, but ultimately like we had observed that they didn't even really seem to notice or care, (laughs) right? They were just like, okay, this is what we do. And the true benefit of choosing to split them would actually be much greater than the true cost because both kids and both parents could have a pleasant holiday even if we weren't together 
right? And so like a large part of the acceptance piece of this and the radical acceptance piece is seeing clearly what your choices are and what the cost benefits are. And most of the time as a parent of a PDA or, or a PDA child or teen, you're going to be choosing between two really crappy options that feel really unfair. And when you do this, you're going to have grief and you're going to feel resentment and rage. And maybe that's what you're feeling towards me right now. And that's okay. Because what I'm doing is outlining for you what you can't change right? And that's triggering and it's upsetting and it makes you confront something you might have been avoiding, right? And that's super uncomfortable and it doesn't feel good and nobody wants to do that. But that is how we use radical acceptance and the decision-making framework to get you unstuck. So I want to plant that seed as you move into the holiday and also give you permission not to do things according to how you have to or should in air quotes. Okay, so once we've made our radical acceptance decisions, then we can move into accommodations, which is really the part where we're like softening some of these activating things like all the excitement of waiting or lowering the demands of what others expect of us, right? So let me give you a few examples. One silly acronym that I've mentioned before that I like to use is called LONER which is just lean into the parts of the holiday that are regulating for your kid, right? So often with like novelty and dopamine, some kids get super into these aspects of the holiday, right? Like I remember when my son was younger, my stepmom sent me these like art projects around making turkeys. And I remember spending like hours because my son was like really into the novelty of turkeys and like, you know, we got to engage with it. It was something he could engage in. Same thing with Halloween. We carved pumpkins every single weekend, <laughs> which you may have heard me mention because we were leaning into that novelty because we had observed that it's regulating. So Think about the ways that you can lean into intense sensory experiences, dopamine and novelty, or even special interests in the context of the holidays, right? So like, you know, if the kids are really enjoying doing crafts, like do them multiple times. Like we can make Christmas ornaments until the entire tree is filled up, which currently is what is what my tree is it's like a bomb went off of crafts because that's what the kids like doing then we have the o of loner which is opting out right and this is a really hard thing for many of us because we have an attachment to how we imagined our christmas would go right so certain things you can do like and these are things that i've done in my home like the last year it was simply too hard for my son to wait for Santa to come. And the past years before that, he had stayed up all night and had panic attacks. And like, we would just spend the whole night de-escalating, right? Like three or four years ago, I remember him waking up like 20 times. I don't even think he was sleeping. He was just like unable to go to sleep. And he would say, mama, my body won't let me right and i remember at 2 in the 2:30 in the morning on christmas eve going to get a present and going to get like part of the dessert that we had made and like putting sprinkles on it and bringing it up and having like a christmas celebration at 2:30 in the morning to like lower his threat response because he needed to not have that demand of waiting and the excitement of waiting because it was activating his fight flight response so much that he couldn't handle it and he was going into panic mode Okay, so we learned our lesson <laughs> and leaned into the fact that like, okay, waiting for Santa or the Easter Bunny or even the days of Hanukkah to fill up all, like to wait to put all the candles in because we do that with grandma, it's too much. So we need to lower the demand and Santa comes on a day that surprises the kids. Like last year he came two days early. All the all the presents were there, the, st the stockings were stuffed. And so Santa arrived before they were expecting it, right? And like, this might not work for all kids, but I'm sharing this with you to give you permission to do things differently. Other ways of opting out or lowering demands might be, you know, not making your kid attend a church service, not making them attend social events around the holidays, not 
putting up decorations if that's activating for them. And this is going to bring up more in you than anything else because we all have attachment to how we want the holidays to look, feel, and be, right? That's totally normal. Totally normal. Okay, so we're still on the accommodations and loner (laughs) acronym. The other thing is no rules, right? Like the no rules of the loner acronym is just letting go of what they eat, if they eat at the Thanksgiving table, the day that you even celebrate the holiday or if and how you celebrate it at all. And then always remembering to pan out because this is a season in your life right? And it's a season in their life. And if you're working towards stability and peace in your family, then there's going to be a time, especially if your child is in burnout or if you're new to this lens, when things don't feel as difficult, right? But we're not going to get there if we're holding on to these traditions and celebrations and ways and expectations that we feel they have to be and prioritizing other family members' preferences and comfort over our child's nervous system needs and like brain accommodations, right? And that's difficult because sometimes our kids don't look disabled and sometimes our kids look typical and often people see this through the behavioral lens. And so it's really going to be about communicating your boundaries with others that's going to make you feel uncomfortable more than potentially what your child is doing, (laughs) right? So the other thing that we work on in the program is called affirmation. So this is the module where I teach families about how to build on the accommodations we learned so that you're setting a foundation to understand the threat response and name the threat response for the child or teen and support them in understanding and choosing their identity, which may or may not end up being PDA, right? So for example, because my son has a clear awareness of what's going on in his nervous system and he calls his threat response venom and he knows he's PDA, we can have conversations about this stuff or do some collaborative problem solving around it because he has the language and the awareness of why, right? And this is a long-term process. Like we did not start there, but this is like the next level that will help you set up a holiday season that will actually support you and your child. So for example, my son, two Thanksgivings ago, he, for the first time, advocated for himself to say, I'm not going to eat turkey. I want a bite of steak so I can celebrate Thanksgiving too. The years prior to that, he would just scream and run and kick and never articulate anything about why or anything about his preferences. So like there wasn't any verbal communication that we were having about like, I need this and me not giving it to him. I just didn't know, right? So this is like the type of progress that we want to see when we give our children a foundation of an affirming identity that allows them to give give them a sense of belonging. And then the, the fifth is advocacy, right? For yourself and for your kids. So this part is more about the discomfort you feel in advocating for your needs if you have a history of fawning, if you're an internalized pda people pleaser, <laughs> perfectionist, peacemaker, or just a woman. <laughs> I mean, I think this is pretty common for many of us moms. Not all of it, but like there's a tendency for us to be accommodating to many other people in our lives, sometimes at the expense of our well-being and peace and our kids. So some of the things that you might want to explore and that are going to bring up triggers in your body and you just want to notice when that happens is the potential to saying no to having guests in your house because remember by osmosis there's going to be more energy in the home more expectations there's going to be more sound there's going to be lots of perceiving that the child or teen doesn't have control or equality with the decision making which is going to activate the fight flight freeze response Remember, that's a subconscious response. It's not something that the PDA child or teen has control over whether or not their brain tells their nervous system that they're under threat. This is just how it works. So we want to accommodate that and make good decisions, right? It might mean 
you not staying in other people's homes and potentially doing that cost benefit decision making framework for like, yeah, it's expensive to get an Airbnb or a hotel, but what's the true cost to our family if we don't do that, right? So thinking about what events you can actually attend with your child where you might need to identify ways to celebrate the holiday that are atypical or not on the exact day. As I mentioned before, splitting up the parents, splitting up the kids, having a younger or an older sibling who's not PDA have a different experience than the pda -er, if that's what they need right? So again, like, yes, for a lot of people, this is hard because of their internal expectations and their desire to have like a storybook Christmas or like the things that we all want, the Pinterest version of our lives, right? But the other thing that's going to be hard is the actual execution of like, hey, thanks for inviting us. We're not going to be able to like make it this year, right? Or like, we would love to socialize with you, but we really can't have guests right now. I can help you find an Airbnb, right? And, and that's hard because it's going to activate your nervous system when you're doing it. These are the things to think through. The awareness of why this is so hard for the kids, radically accepting and teens, radically accepting that it is difficult. It's going to be more difficult than it usually is. Understanding how to see clearly what you're not accepting as not under your control, right? And a big piece of this is your child's nervous system and brain in this particular moment, right? They, there may be changes over time with how accumulated the nervous system activation is. However, in this current moment, we have to look at the true cost of doing something versus the true benefit, not the fear cost or the desired cost and the fear or desired or perceived benefit. Like it's looking clearly at what actually is and make decision, making decisions in the current moment with that reality. And that will bring up grief, resentment, and anger. But if that happens, you know you're doing it right because it means you're actually accepting and you're not avoiding anymore, which is what most of us do, myself included, because we like attach on trying to change something that actually we can't change and it allows us to avoid the reality of what it actually is. I know that from experience because I spent many years, <laughs> many years trying to make it different than it was. And I don't want you guys to go through the same pain and length of the trial and error that I did. Then third, we talked about accommodations. We have obviously autonomy, quality, lowering demands, language accommodations. You can use declarative language, reduce spoken language, use humor, play, lots of different ways we can accommodate, but we're gonna need to go deeper in the holidays. And then affirmation, normalizing, normalizing. Yeah, of course you're having a hard time, right? You, of course, there are all these demands around you like, there's a whole meal next week with Thanksgiving where it's like, even if I as the parent are like, Cooper, no worries, like you don't have to eat turkey, like who cares? Even if I say that, if everybody else is doing it and talking about it, again, he's gonna perceive that that's the expectation energetically. So it will activate. And then finally, the advocacy piece is a huge piece. And the main takeaway I would suggest that you guys take away is if you can focus on making specific requests for what your child needs, like for example, can I make a request that when we arrive for Thanksgiving, Cooper be allowed to use his iPad and go into another room until dessert. So he might miss the Thanksgiving dinner. Instead of approaching it with a family member of like, here's my PowerPoint slide about what PDA is and I'm gonna convince you for the 10th time. And I don't say that disparagingly or condescendingly, I say that from experience of trying <laughs> to explain over and over again, like what PDA is and realizing that sometimes it's more important to just focus practically on like what we need as a family and then take the response, the yes, no response from whether it's a teacher, a therapist, a family member, a neighbor, take the yes or no, we can do that as data 
for understanding if I need to set boundaries or not, rather than the energy leak of like, I'm going to continually try to explain this to you. So I just want to invite you into that small shift in how you're thinking about interacting with people in your life around the holidays, navigating this with your PDA child or teen, and remembering it's going to be hardest to set boundaries with people you love the most. Okay, the people you're most intimate with are going to be the ones where it's hardest to set boundaries. And and the holidays are a time when you're diving back into all your childhood relationships and all of your family. And it's going to be an even difficult, more difficult time. So I'm going to end with that. I hope it was helpful to you guys. And I hope you have a great Thanksgiving if you're here in the U.S. Because I'm not going to do a live next week. I'm going to be with the kids all week. And we'll see each other here in a week. All right, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everyone, for being here with me at the At Peace Parents podcast. This is your source for all things related to understanding, supporting, accommodating, and advocating for your PDA child. To go deeper on any of these topics, check out my course offerings and masterclasses at the website www.atpeaceparents.com. To completely transform the way you think about and relate to your child and to bring peace and stability to your home, join us for the next cohort of the Paradigm Shift program.